Hello students, welcome to lecture 4.1, African Americans in the early 20th century. In this lecture, we will focus on the African Americans in the early 1900s, so that's the 20th century, as they are facing racial segregation and inequality under the Plessy Ferguson case, as well as the Jim Crow laws. I uh, will talk about all of that in module 3. So we will first compare uh, the strategies or approach adopted by uh, people like uh, Booker T. Washington and uh, W.E.B. Du Bois. Then we will talk about uh, the most important African-American organization of a century. So that was uh, the National Association of the Advancement of Colored People well known uh, as the NAACP. Then uh, we will talk about other organizations such as the Black Women and Club Movement. And uh, at the end of the lecture, uh, we will discuss uh, the Great Migration. First of all, uh, who was Booker T. Washington? So most people know the name but they don't really know uh, who was this person. So Booker T. Washington was born uh, as a slave in Virginia in 1856. Uh, he put himself through school after Civil War, uh, so he had to pay himself uh, the tuition at Hampton Institute. Uh, we know the story because he wrote a book about that. Then uh, after his graduation, uh, he got help from different people to create uh, the school uh, in Tuskegee, so that's uh, the Tuskegee Normal and uh, Industrial Institute, uh, which is known as Tuskegee University today. So he did that, he created the Tuskegee Institute in 1881 in Alabama, and uh, ultimately, uh, through his career, uh, Booker T. Washington became one of the most influential African-American leaders in the history. So what was Booker T's approach to racial uh, uh, segregation and uh, inequality? Uh, his approach consisted mainly in accepting segregation for now. Uh, he made this clear in uh, in different occasions, he thought that uh, African Americans at that time, at the end of uh, 1800 and early 1900, uh, didn't know much, they didn't have uh, enough knowledge, and uh, they were too poor to compete for uh, equality with the white people. So, according to uh, Booker T. Washington, the best approach at that time was just to accept segregation. So. Uh, you make money and uh, you get knowledge and uh, when you do that then uh, you become uh, equal to white people. So how do you get rich and how do you get the knowledge? He promoted, so that's his second approach, he promoted what is known as industrial and agricultural education as opposed to just to go to school and learn different things like uh, learning philosophy, English, uh, and uh, after that uh, you really don't know what to do with uh, uh, your knowledge, uh, but uh, if you learn how to build house, how to uh, how to grow things, then uh, you, you may get rich in the end, so that's his second approach. Next, uh, he also suggests to make uh, white people your friends, so he had uh, white uh, politicians as well as white businessmen as his friends. Uh, that include a president like uh, Theodore Roosevelt and uh, some of the richest people in America at his time, uh, including Andrew Carnegie. So he made those people uh, his friends. So that's another approach of uh, uh, Booker T. Washington. And uh, one of his most uh, famous uh, statement uh, was made at Atlanta and that was known as 
of the Atlanta Compromise. So uh, during this uh, uh, speech in Atlanta, uh, he told uh, white people and black people to work together uh, to the, for mutual progress and uh, share responsibility. So that was uh, the statement that made him famous known as the Atlanta Compromise. So black and white people working together for mutual uh, benefit. But uh, because of uh, his approach, uh, many uh, black people didn't agree with him, and especially W.E.B. Du Bois uh, was one of uh, a person who was vocal, who was very critical of uh, uh, Booker T's uh, approach. So we can see on this picture, uh, the picture of uh, Booker T. Washington in 1905. So now let's turn to the second uh, most influential uh, African Americans at that time. So that was W.E.B. Uh, du Bois. Uh, if you want to know uh, what uh, W.E.B. Uh, stands for, uh, please look out in the, in the dictionary. But uh, the first initial is just uh, William, and the second uh, is Earnhardt, and uh, the, the B is uh, Burkhardt. So, uh, uh, he's just known as W.E.B. Du Bois, or just Du Bois. So, contrary to Booker T. Washington, uh, D, uh, who, uh, who was born a slave, uh, Du Bois was born free, and uh, he was not born in the South. He was born in Massachusetts in the North uh, after Civil War uh, in 1868. And uh, uh, because he was from uh, a mixed family, uh, he went through uh, integrated primary and secondary schools, so he attended school with white and black people, and uh, he attended actually uh, the college that he attended was uh, HBCU, uh, Fisk University, in uh, in Tennessee, and then uh, he was the first African American to earn a PhD from Harvard. So after Fisk, Fisk, he went to Harvard and earned a PhD in uh, sociology uh, in 1895. Then he uh, he became politically active and he helped uh, creating uh, two most important African-American organizations. So those are the Niagara Movement and uh, the second one was the NAACP. And uh, he became also of a long-time editor uh, of, of a crisis. The crisis was uh, the NAACP's magazine. So, what was uh, W.E.B. Du Bois' approach to uh, racial uh, segregation and racial inequality? Uh, what was uh, his uh, strategy? What uh, did he uh, think uh, to uh, uh, to solve this problem. So, uh, uh, first of all, we have to, uh, we already said that he didn't agree with uh, Booker T. Washington, so he rejected everything that uh, uh, Booker T. Uh, Washington was doing, uh, which was based on industrial education and uh, also accepting segregation for now. Uh, uh, according to uh, Du Bois, uh, African Americans should learn uh, anything and mostly uh, should uh, be educated in liberal uh, education and uh, not just in technical uh, and agricultural uh, education. So he put emphasis on uh, liberal education. So that's uh, one of the first uh, part of his approach. Secondly, uh, he also want to form a, a group of black elite. So um, a small group of educated black uh, uh, people uh, known as the, ten, uh, the talented 10th. So uh, about 10% of all African Americans should be uh, formed, should be well educated. And uh, those talented 10th uh, would take care of uh, the uplifting 
uh, the advancement of the rest of uh, the African American uh, people. So that's his major, major approach. And uh, 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 in addition to that, uh, he suggested and actually uh, uh, he participated in protesting against uh, inequality and creating organization to protest uh, um, inequality and uh, segregation. So this is why he participated in the creation of the Niagara movement as well as uh, the creation of, uh, of the NAACP. So that was, uh, in summary, uh, Booker uh, W. E. B. Du Bois' approach. So uh, we can see on this uh, picture uh, W. E. B. Du Bois uh, back in uh, 1918. Uh, he has a long history, and uh, actually, uh, he had to flee this country. And uh, if you are interested, uh, please read his biography. A very interesting uh, uh, man. The most important African American organization, like I said earlier, uh, that was created in the early 1900s, uh, was the NAACP. So, uh, as mentioned earlier, uh, before the NAACP, there was another organization the Niagara Movement that was created uh, by Du Bois and uh, uh, many of his friends in, uh, in Canada in 1905. But uh, this organization did not last too long. So uh, he, he, he just disbanded uh, a few years after his creation. But after the Niagara Movement, the NAACP was uh, founded in 1909 in Baltimore, uh, Maryland, and uh, it was uh, it was not a continuation uh, of the Niagara Movement. So there's no uh, direct link between the Niagara Movement and uh, the, uh, the NAACP. The only thing that they have in common was that uh, uh, Du Bois uh, was a founder, uh, one of the founders of both organizations, but uh, the two organizations were not related at all. So, uh, uh, what was the main objective of the NAACP? So, according to its name, uh, the main objective, the, the, the mission was to ensure the political and education, uh, social and economic equality uh, of rights of all persons and uh, to eliminate racial hatred and uh, racial discrimination. So, not only do they promote um, equality, but they also uh, fight uh, uh, discrimination. So, so that's uh, the, the objective of the NAACP. So in addition to uh, uh, Du Bois, the founding members uh, of the NAACP included a lady, a white lady by the name of uh, Mary White uh, Ovington and uh, another white man a uh, Moorefield uh, story. So we can see on this picture, on this figure, of the founding members of the NAACP uh, in 1909. Uh, you may be surprised to see uh, from the right, from the left to right, uh, you have uh, the gentleman uh, by the name of uh, Moorefield Story, and then you have a lady, uh, Mary uh, White Ovington, and uh, uh, you may already recognize W.E.B. Du Bois. And uh, like I said earlier, uh, you can see that uh, two of the founding members were uh, white, and uh, only uh, uh, W.E.B. Du Bois was the black man uh, founding uh, member. Concerning the strategies of uh, the NAACP, uh, we can summarize the strategy as using the, uh, the existing legal system. So that's the main strategy of the NAACP. So they use uh, the court 
at different levels so starting with a county and then state and all the way to the supreme court they use the court system to fight inequality and racial segregation so uh, as soon as it was created uh, the NAACP got uh, some victories and uh, some of the major victory uh, as soon as uh, its creation some of the major victory was um, uh, the victory in the case against uh, a grandfather clause uh, in Oklahoma in 1915. We talk about uh, the grandfather clause uh, in uh, module 3. So uh, in this case, the Supreme Court said that uh, this uh, clause was unconstitutional. So uh, Oklahoma and other states had to get rid of uh, the grandfather clause as a, a, a tactic to uh, prevent black people from uh, voting so that's a major uh, victory and uh, the most uh, important victory of the NAACP which led to uh, the desegregation of schools as well as all public facility uh, was uh, the Brown uh, versus the Board of Education case so in this case, uh, the U.S. Supreme Court says that uh, the, the, the separation was not, did not mean equality. So uh, the doctrine of uh, separate but equal that was established by uh, Plessy versus Ferguson was unconstitutional. So all states and all the, the whole United States have to, has to get rid of segregation of black and white in uh, in uh, public facilities at least but uh, in private uh, facility you can do that but in public facility you cannot no longer uh, segregate uh, separate uh, black people from white people so that was a major major victory of the NAACP Uh, there were other organizations, uh, uh, African-American organizations fighting racial segregation and inequality uh, since uh, the late 1800s. But uh, uh, most, uh, most of them did not gain national prominence, which means they were not known nationally. And uh, most of them actually did not last uh, too long. But uh, one of them, uh, which, were, which is worth noting, is the, uh, the National Association of Colored Women, so that's the uh, NACW. This organization was founded in 1896 to end poverty and racial uh, discrimination. And uh, uh, this organization has an interesting uh, slogan, which was... Uh, lifting as we climb so that was a slogan of uh, this women's organization and uh, the first president was uh, a well-known lady uh, by the name of uh, mary church terrell uh, by uh, 1914 uh, the nicw had uh, already up to 50,000 members and uh, um, uh, about a thousand clubs uh, around the country. So that was a famous uh, uh, widespread uh, organization. Uh, in addition to the NAACP and uh, the uh, NACW, uh, you have also different clubs. Uh, and uh, uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, one of them, uh, which was of the Phyllis uh, Whitley Club. So the first uh, Phyllis Whitley Club was created in Nashville, Tennessee in 1895. And uh, the objective was uh, to provide living accommodation uh, for urban uh, black working women. Uh, it also offered uh, women uh, rooms in cities where the, the y YWCA uh, or deny them uh, a room. Uh, 
Finally, uh, one of the major uh, historical events that happened in the early 1900s was the Great Migration. So what was this uh, Great Migration? Uh, there were actually different waves of migration from uh, the southeast, migration of uh, African Americans, former slaves uh, from the southeast, uh, where they were concentrated, uh, to other parts of the countries, um, especially to the northeast, the midwest, and uh, to the west. But uh, the first wave of migration was uh, in uh, the early 1900s. So what are the causes of this uh, uh, first great migration? So uh, the cause of this uh, great migration included uh, the agricultural disaster that happened in the south uh, in the 1910th. There were uh, a bug um, uh, that destroyed the plants in the south, so that led many sharecroppers and uh, many uh, black people who were working in the field to uh, to move in other place, and then there are uh, there was also a, a shortage of labor uh, in different cities due to uh, uh, World War One. So during World War One, the United States had to increase its industrial production. So uh, the the industries, uh, the factories in the north need. Uh, workers, so that also attracted many African Americans to work in those factories uh, in the northern cities. And uh, other uh, cause, um, which was very important also, uh, was uh, the Jim Crow law, the law on segregation and lack of opportunity for black people in the South. So all of those led many uh, African Americans to move to the north, to the Midwest, uh, and the West. So, uh, as we already said uh, in the previous slides, uh, the destination of the Great Migration were uh, the Midwestern cities uh, like uh, Detroit in Michigan or Pittsburgh uh, in Pennsylvania. Uh, or of the northern cities, northeastern cities, like Washington DC, uh, New York, and uh, Philadelphia. But there are a few of them who went uh, to, uh, to California, but uh, not as many as those who went to, to uh, Michigan or uh, to New York. So that concludes this lecture for point one. So uh, please complete the reading and then move to a lecture 4.2 to continue.